So in this video, we're going to be talking about Greece before it was Greece. We're going to be looking back to the civilizations and the periods of time that led up to the civilization that we know of as ancient Greece. And this is really going to break down into three different periods. First, we're going to look, and we're going to take a decent amount of time to look at the Minoan civilization. And one of the things we need to be very clear about when it comes to the Minoans is that they weren't actually related to the Greeks, but they were taken over by the ancestors of the Greeks, and those folks ended up adopting a lot of Minoan culture and a lot of Minoan mythology. After the Minoans, we're going to be looking at a group called the Mycenaeans, and these are the ancestors of the Greeks. These are proto-Greeks. You could think of the Mycenaeans as proto-Greeks. And they're the ones that will adopt and take over much of the Minoan civilization. And then we're just going to take a quick look at a period called the Homeric Age, or really the Greek Dark Ages. This is after the Mycenaean civilization falls, and the descendants of the Mycenaeans, plus some other folks, reform themselves into the Hellenes, or the Greeks. Side note, the ancient Greeks didn't call themselves Greek. They called themselves Hellenes or Hellens. So Minoan civilization really is centered over here on this island of Crete, that big one in the Mediterranean. And really Crete forms the southern barrier of an entire region that is going to be the center of the Greek world. This is called the Aegean Sea. Well, around the year 7000 BCE, people from Anatolia, that area that will become the Hittite Empire or the Kingdom of Hatti, this big peninsula over here, around the year 7000 BCE, some people from Anatolia had found a way over their way over to Crete, and they brought agriculture with them. These were the first human beings that we know of that settled on the island of Crete. And like their cousins over in the Fertile Crescent, they slowly developed throughout the Neolithic period, and by the time we get to the Bronze Age, they are starting to make significant advances. Around the year 2600 BCE, we get the first hints of larger buildings within the Cretan, or what will become to be known as the Minoan culture. Some graves had extra goods, and of course we're familiar with this uh, from our study of the Neolithic period. This is showing that some people are starting to have more wealth, it, that means that society is starting to develop hierarchy, but this is pretty limited. It, it seems that just a few families had gained some prominence. But around the year 2100 BCE, the island of Crete had a population boom. Interestingly enough, this is just around the time the Old Kingdom fell, and the Minoans are always going to have a connection with Egypt. As a matter of fact, their connection with Egypt will make later Greeks think, or at least some later Greeks think, that their culture was rooted in Egypt through the Minoan civilization, through the Mycenaeans, through the Homeric period up to ancient Greece. And the coincidence of this population boom at the same time as the Old Kingdom is falling apart into all those different city-states again into the first intermediate period kind of makes me wonder if some Egyptian higher-ups made their way to the island of Crete. Because it wasn't long after that, in the year 2000, a multi-room complex was built in the town of, was built in a place called Knossos, or Knossos. This was a palace. This was a palace that had rooms for storage. And not long after that was built, around the year 2000, smaller pal palaces Smaller palaces soon appeared all around the island. And so you get the introduction rather quickly around the year 2000 BCE of this palace-centered economy, kind of like what was going on in places like Egypt and Mesopotamia. In fact, just to make sure we have a refresher here, it's around the year 4000 BCE that the first cities or large villages started forming in Egypt and Mesopotamia, and they were formed around temples which acted as storehouses and redistribution centers of goods. By the time we get to the year 3200 BCE, bronze became widespread across the Fertile Crescent. And by the time we get to the year 2800 BCE, kings were starting to replace priests as rulers in all of these cities, particularly in Mesopotamia. And palaces became the new centers of cities. They took over the redistrib redistribution process of goods. 
while in Crete they just kind of skipped over that whole temple process and went straight to this idea of having palace-centered redistribution centers, palace-centered economies, a place where people could bring all the goods that they were growing or, as we're going to see in the Minoan case, trading with other folks, and a place where the local community would always know that there was food. And this right here are the ruins of the Palace of Noso. Some of it has been renovated in the modern day to make it look like it did beforehand. But you can see this is a pretty vast area, and really these images don't cover the whole, the whole picture. But it was a complex. Now, to run these palace economies, just as Fertile Crescent civilizations had to do, the, the Minoans developed their own writing system. The writing system that we're familiar with is something called Linear A, and it, we're pretty sure it's pictographic, that symbols represent specific things, though we're not totally sure because we haven't been able to decipher it yet. It does appear to be somewhat similar to hieroglyphics. Remember again that Egyptian connection? But Linear A was first really identified in the 1890s CE, so about 130 years ago, and scholars still haven't figured out how to read it yet. If you ever want to make your name in academia, and you like, you like puzzles, there you go. So like I alluded to a second ago, the Minoans were a trading culture. They had been growing for a long time and continue to grow olives on the island of Crete. It's a fantastic place to grow olives, and out of those olives, of course, you, of course you get olive oil. And olive oil was sought all over the ancient world, because it could be a lubricant for things like, like wheels and axles, but it could also be a, an important source of fat, particularly for people that almost completely lived on grain. You have to have some fat in your diet. Olive oil would do it. And it could be used even for burning in lamps. The Minoans began as a culture that traded olive oil with other civilizations for things that they wanted. And being the center of trade, as the Minoans made themselves out to be, is a fantastic way to build wealth. Now, originally in the early Bronze Age, before things were really getting going, they traded extensively just in the Cyclades. That's these islands that are in the Aegean Sea. This is right next to what will become the Greek world. By the time we get to the Middle Bronze Age, though, they were trading with larger states like the Hittite Empire and states and kingdoms in Syria and, of course, Egypt. Because as you can see from this map here, Crete was right in the middle of things. And being a seafaring people, they can move goods rather quickly. And it's this boom in trade that made palaces possible. It's also possibly how the Minoans picked up on the concept. Now, like I said, the first palace at Knossos was built around the year 2000 BCE. Though the image that we looked at a second ago and this map right here, this reconstruction of what the palace looked like, probably started around the year 1750 BCE. This entire palace, this, this building the, of connected buildings and passageways, covered about 3.2 acres. It had somewhere around 300 rooms. It, it was two or three stories high, depending on the area of the, the palace. And in addition to those stories, there were basements. It was organized around this central courtyard that we'll be talking about in a second. It was made of stone and mud brick, and it was reinforced with wood so it could withstand earthquakes, which were somewhat common in the region. But one of the most wild things about this palace is it made use of things like light wells, as you can see on the roof of uh, some of these buildings, where it figured out how to channel light and even fresh air into the interior of the palace. They had passageways that caught the wind, so that the palace was always air-conditioned. Maybe even more mind-blowing, it had indoor plumbing. You didn't have to poop in a, in a bucket and then walk the bucket out of the palace. They had a system that sent all that sewage away. And just looking back at that image, they had these beautiful porticos that had amazing paintings on them with these really cool pillars that were smaller at the bottom and larger at the top. But what I really want to emphasize is that these palaces, this is Knossos, but remember there are other palaces like it built all over the island of Crete. These palaces were storage hubs. These were places where the people that lived and worked there, that were merchants, they could drop off goods, pick something up from somewhere else, reload their boat, and of course redistribute those goods from the palace to the surrounding countryside. 
The Noan palaces weren't just unique in that they bypassed that stage in civilization that used temples as the centerpiece. But when we look at the decorations of other Middle East palaces, they're always about glorifying royalty. There's always pictures of kings everywhere, kings conquering things, kings looking almost godlike. But Minoan palaces just depicted the life of people. They depicted plants and animals and life activities and religious processions and other rituals. There is no king-looking figure that can be found anywhere so far. And this tells us something about the development of hierarchy within Crete. We know that there was some development early on while they were still in the Stone Age, so certainly the people that were living in the palace and running the palace had more sway or more power within the surrounding lands. But it appears that within that class of people, the class that were of the palace, there was no clear hierarchy, or at least it doesn't seem like there's any type of clear hierarchy. Though again, remember, we still have not been able to decipher Linear A. So while we have plenty of paintings from them that we can see what was going on, we can't read what they said was going on. Minoan art almost always shows people as young and very graceful, and while we would normally think of this as some type of idealized version of people, more than likely most of the people that lived in Crete were young. People on Crete, usually men lived to around 35 years old, women around 30 years old. There were a few people that made it to their 50s. Can you imagine making your 50s and being treated as some wise old person that remembers the long, long ago? Men were shaved and they wore Egyptian-like kilts. Women wore dresses that had their breasts exposed. This is, down here in the bottom left, uh, an image of a religious procession. And it's worth noting the different skin tones. The men obviously have much darker skin. It's possible that's just because the men were doing most of the sailing, so they're much more tanned. It's also possible that these were folks that were sent from other lands as some type of slave or servant to the palace folk. And it, the Greeks are going to have a legend later on of having to send youth to go be sacrificed to these people that lived on Crete. We'll talk about that in a bit. Minoan art was pretty exceptionally bright and beautiful, particularly for the time, and Minoan artists were clearly hired on in places like Egypt and the Levant or Syria, Canaan. It's also worth noting that it's a woman leading this religious procession. When I say hierarchy doesn't seem to have evolved there, it seems like hierarchy along with patriarchy hadn't. Elite women seem to hold equal rank with elite men, possibly even superior rank. It's pretty clear that priestesses always outrank priests in any type of religious processions that we see depicted on Crete. And so it seems that there are three tiers of Minoan society. There were palace families, then there were families that lived in multi-room, multi-story villas within towns, but they weren't really as large as one of these palace economic centers, and then there's everybody else. But beyond these three divisions, within each level, there is no indication of rank, there is no indication that men or women were telling the other sex what to do. Minoans weren't just great painters. They were outstanding sculptors as well. This is a, a stone bullhead that was a libation vessel. A libation is just something you pour out in a religious ceremony. And this was actually created so that somebody could pour wine or milk into the back of the head and it would come out of the mouth of the bull that could be poured down onto the ground, returning things back to the mother goddess. Remember Venus figurines? This idea of a mother goddess of fertility hadn't gone away everywhere, even though it certainly had went away in places like Mesopotamia and Egypt. Speaking of bulls... The Minoan religion appears to be totally focused on fertility. Art focuses on nature, particularly bulls and wild goats. There were private shrines in some dwellings, and there were definitely public shrines on hilltops and on caves. But it appears that the only really communal worship areas that people gathered at were those palace courtyards. Remember that central courtyard that was a feature of all Minoan palaces. And those courtyards that were probably used for communal worship? They were definitely used for the favorite pastime of the Minoans, bull leaping. 
Within the courtyards, barriers were set up to protect spectators, bulls were released, and teams worked together to grab horns and flip over bulls. They might have even rode them rodeo style. And again, without deciphering their language, this may have had religious significance, it may have been a competition, and it might have just been entertainment for everybody. A quick word on this word fresco. Fresco is just a type of painting where you paint on plaster, on wet plaster, and you paint really fast so that as the plaster dries, the, the paint actually sets into that plaster. Done very freshly. Fresco. Now, the Minoans definitely had some pantheon of gods. We can see several gods and goddesses that get repeated, including, for sure, a bull god, though it's pretty tough to identify and define any of their gods without writing. Now, there were very few male gods, many more female gods, and the chief deity is clearly a goddess. She's referred to by archaeologists and historians as the Minoan Lady. She is a fertility goddess, she was closely associated with snakes. You can see over here on the right, that's her holding snakes in each hand. And Mother Earth goddesses throughout the Fertile Crescent very often were associated with snakes, snakes that are always close to the ground, snakes that shed their skin and become anew regularly, just like the Earth does every year in the spring. There had been a long connection between this idea of a mother goddess, a mother earth goddess, and snakes. The Minoans are just continuing traditions that have been popping up probably since the Neolithic. And of course, as we've already seen, as male-dominated priesthoods emerge, mother goddesses were demoted or they were completely eliminated in other pantheons. And a really good example of this is the story of Adam, Eve, and the serpent in the Garden of Eden. We have this association of these original powerful beings of Adam and Eve, and Eve, who works with the serpent. This seems very similar to a mother goddess being demoted for her mistake, for, for her sin. If you're familiar with the punishment that Adam and Eve got after eating of the, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam forever is going to have to labor to bring food forth from the land, all of the women are going to have to experience painful childbirth and, very importantly, again in this demotion of things, women forever have to take orders from their husbands. And so again, throughout the Fertile Crescent, particularly within the Semitic world, we see this demotion of powerful women and of women goddesses. The Minoans were still holding on to this well into the Late Bronze Age. The Minoan lady quite often has male gods that appear to be her consorts, but in all the imagery we have of her, when she's accompanied by humans, she seems to favor women acolytes, or women who are worshiping her over men. Again, I've been saying this is a very equitable society, but it is possible that it was a matriarchal society. If it was, it certainly wasn't as tilted as the patriarchal societies. There's still a lot more equity, but there's a lot of indication that women had more power or at least were more revered within this society. So like I had said before, the Minoans throughout the early Bronze Age, so around 3200 to around 2100 BCE, they traded primarily with people who had settled in the Cyclades. Then around the year 2100 BCE, they have a, a population boom, and their trade and their influence rapidly expanded after that as they were building these palaces, probably in part to keep up with the need for storehouses for all this increased trade. Well, by the time we get to the Middle Bronze Age, by the time we get to around the years 2100 to 1600 BCE, the people of the Cyclades were adopting Minoan culture. Not just the art of the Minoans, but they were adopting similar lifestyles, clothing, similar religion. We're seeing a lot of the same things popping up in the Cyclades during that period. It's pretty clear that there were some Minoans who were settling throughout these different islands. But I want to emphasize this is not an empire. As a matter of fact, there was no Minoan king or queen who ruled over all of Crete. Each palace was its own independent center. There was no Minoan empire. And so when we're talking about the spread of culture, you really should just be thinking about people adopting ways 
probably some rich Minoans settled down and become the center of a community. They helped support a smaller village or something like that, and people start adopting the styles and the religion of that person. We see this happen all the time in the modern day when it comes to celebrities and how people adopt their ways over time. And by the time we get to the end of the Middle Bronze Age, there were even folks on the mainland of Greece that were starting to adopt their culture. I mean, Minoan culture was riding high by the time we get to the Middle Bronze Age, and inhabitants of Crete were living exceptionally well. But then, almost all of a sudden, around the year 1450 BCE, all of the palaces of Crete, except for Knossos, were burned to the ground. And Knossos itself was occupied by a different group of people. Whatever Minoans there were left, they had been scattered all across the Aegean and the Mediterranean Sea. But hold on to that thought. We'll be back to these Minoans in a moment. Now I want to talk a little bit about the people who end up taking them over. You might remember those Indo-Europeans. These are folks who came from the Caucasus Mountains and, and Plains in that region between the Black and Caspian Seas. The Indo-Europeans were the folks that invented the chariot. They're the ancestors of the Hittites and the Medes and the Persians. And you definitely should know them as we move forward because they're also going to be the ancestors of the Greeks, the Romans, the Celts, the Germans in Europe. And when we go in our next unit over to India, they are the ancestors of a group of people called the Aryans, a group that will end up taking over India. Well, a group of these Indo-Europeans invaded the Greek mainland around the year 1700 BCE. They fought with chariots, and the local people did not have a chance. These Indo-European chariot riders could be thought of as the Proto-Greeks. They spoke a language that would really become the root of ancient Greek. And they were essentially the genetic ancestor of most Greeks by the time we get to the Classical Age. This chariot-riding Indo-European group are called Mycenaeans. They were actually the people on the mainland of Greece who ended up adopting a bit of a known culture. Later Greeks are going to receive their culture from the Mycenaeans. And of course, since the Mycenaeans received some of their culture from the Minoans, you can see how this makes the Minoans the root of Greek culture. But while Minoans were peaceful merchant folk, the Mycenaeans were warrior people. Like Minoans, the Mycenaeans built palaces that would kind of reign over chunks of land, palaces that could act as storehouses. But Mycenaeans added other touches to this palace system. Number one, they built their palaces on hilltops, on what we would call an acropolis. So you can see in the upper right over here, it was built up on a hill. As you can see on the left, it gives them a fantastic view of any approaching armies or even being able to keep an eye on any villagers in the area. It was common on these Mycenaean palace or Acropolis complexes that there would just be one way in. And this is actually the ramp that goes up to uh, the palace of Mycenae. This gate is rather famous. It's called the Lion Gate. But there were doors that could be closed on any army that was invading. And if you remember that image of the Minoan palace and how it was set out on Knossos, it didn't have walls. It wasn't built in this very defensive posture. The Minoans, again, were not warrior peoples. We don't see a bunch of weapons. We don't see anything. We don't see many things within their culture that indicate they did any fighting. But with the Mycenaeans, there are many things that show us they were a warrior culture. Not just the palaces they built, but within Mycenaean burial grounds warriors were always buried with their weapons. And while there were definitely pit graves, graves that were dug into the ground, warriors put in there, and then their weapons are put on top of them, sometimes maybe even a horse or a bit of a chariot, there was one type of burial that it seems like the Mycenaeans might have adopted from the Minoans. Tholos tombs. Sometimes these are called beehive tombs. These are built into the sides of hills, and so this tomb of Agamemnon, this is actually very close to the palace of Mycenae. The beehive structure that I was referring to is this tall conical structure. So within the side of the hill, there are these stones that are built all the way up to a point. In the front, there would have been two massive bronze doors that were hung. And it was royalty who got to use these tombs or who had the ability to actually build and use these, these tombs. 
The way funerals would work is after the king was brought into the tomb and laid down with all of his weapons, these two massive bronze doors would be shut, and then this whole pathway in would be filled in with rubble and dirt. Some of these were used just once, some of them were used over multiple generations, so you fill it in, and then after the next king dies, you dig your way out, you open the big bronze doors again, you go ahead and, and uh, bury your other king there, or really just lay your king to rest within the Tholos tomb, close the doors, bury it down again. These Tholos tombs are incredibly impressive, and later Greeks, when we get hundreds of years in the future, Later Greeks saw these tombs as tombs of their ancient heroes. If you're familiar with names like Perseus or Theseus or Heracles, you might know Heracles by his Latin name Hercules. Well, these were folks that were remembered by the Greeks as demigods, as, as being almost godlike, definitely above being human. And they had hero cults that worshipped these folks. Well, they would conduct rituals right in front of these Tholos tombs. And many of those heroes that they were worshipping probably at some point were Mycenaean kings. Now Mycenaeans probably learned how to take to the sea from Minoans, and they used that technology to turn around and conquer Minoan settlements, making their way out through the Cyclades, taking over Minoan settlements and making them into Mycenaean settlements. And again, by the time we get to the year 1450 BCE, either one or multiple bands of Mycenaeans invaded Crete. They burned down all the palaces except for Knossos, and they occupy Knossos. Whichever Mycenaean tribe it was that occupied Knossos, they also ended up developing a writing system. Apparently it built off of the Linear A of the Minoans. Who knows? Maybe they even got a Minoan slave to create this new writing system for them. But it's a system we call Linear B. It, it, Linear B was discovered around the same time as Linear A in the 1890s, but Linear B has actually been deciphered. It was deciphered in the 1950s. And so we actually know some of the things the Mycenaeans were talking about. But this was not a writing system that was used for writing epics and writing histories. It was used for keeping track of goods. Even with the burning of, of all those palaces and the attacks that they had taken from the Mycenaeans, Minoan culture limped on for a few more generations. And the Mycenaeans still seem to be trying to emulate a lot of Minoan culture, particularly at Knossos. But it is important to remember that Mycenaeans shared culture, but they weren't a unified people. Kings regularly made war on each other. And in the year 1375, so just 75 years later, Knossos was destroyed in a fire. Probably one of the Mycenaean kings attacked another one. And if I can't have the palace, you don't get to have the palace either. And the Minoans, for the Mycenaeans, fade into myth. By the time we get to the late 13th century BCE, though, so the second half of the 1200s, 1230s, 1240s, 1220s, several Mycenaean palaces started extending their walls. They started building up more powerful fortifications. It seems pretty clear they are preparing for something. And sometime around the year 1200 BCE, six major palaces in, on the mainland were burned to the ground. These were possibly the first victims of the Sea People. It's also possible that the Mycenaeans were being invaded by another wave of Indo-European speakers, a group of folks that are sometimes referred to as the Dorians. And we do know this new group of Dorians came into Greece around this time. We don't know how violent it was, though there are definitely stories by later Greeks about it being violent. And it's the Dorians and the Mycenaeans eventually intermixing with each other that will give us classical Greek culture. One other little bit with these Mycenaeans. We know that some of them became sea peoples themselves. One group of them is going to end up settling down in Canaan. They'll be called a group called the Philistines. Have you ever heard of a guy named Goliath? Goliath was almost definitely a descendant of the Mycenaeans. So Goliath was kind of a Greek. And hopefully we all remember the effects of the Bronze Age collapse. Trade dried up, population levels dropped, and in Greece, population dry levels dropped precipitously. In the areas where the palaces were burned to the ground, everybody that survived just took to becoming a nomad. And in many other areas of Mycenaean Greece, villages that once had hundreds dropped to dozens, and many of them completely disappeared. 
large cities like the mycenaean city of athens still existed but they turned into villages but again many people at this point were wandering dorians coming in were still wandering mycenaeans that had lost their land and were trying to stay safe were wandering and of course many people just died of starvation when trade dries up so does regular food supplies particularly during times of famine particularly during times when farmers are no longer on their farms because they were killed by invaders or they ran away so in greece the bronze age collapse gives way to what we call the homeric or the heroic age though the word that you'll hear very often is the dark age of greece which lasted from around 1200 750 bce and it's called the dark age because writing disappears there is no record of what's happening during that time there was still plenty of art that was taking place this specific bit of pottery comes from the very end of the homeric age the stuff that was being made earlier on was much more simple it was geometric patterns but with the sudden collapse society lost most of its hierarchy those old mycenaean kings were no longer kings there was nothing to be kings over the warrior class was not able to exist on its own without some type of peasant class to support it and so you end up with all these very egalitarian villages and egalitarian bands of roaming people but there was one type of person that still was often elevated to a position of authority we'll be talking about their greek name in the next lecture but for right now you just need to know there that anthropologists would call them big men these are folks that are very charismatic they knew how to speak to people and get people motivated and there are also people that were strong enough or dudes that were strong enough to put the hurting on somebody who was either threatening their community or was just stepping out of line within their community these are not folks that can pass down their authority to their kids they're not really kings but they are the person that everybody in the group looks to for leadership and quite often they're the one person that is willing and able to do combat with somebody that wants to hurt members of their group later poets and storytellers will tell of this time as a time of heroes they'll remember these people that regularly did individual combat matter of fact later greek storytellers won't just tell of this homeric age but they're going to have mycenaean memories they're going to continue to tell so storytellers during this homeric age kept alive a lot of the stories of the mycenaean civilization and even the old stories of the minoans like i said before many mythical heroes themselves just might have been mycenaean kings that got embellished upon during this homeric age and the city of troy which was not a greek city but it was one of the cities that was destroyed during the bronze age collapse and it's quite possible it was destroyed by dorians by people who would become greeks well poets and storytellers of the homeric age would around the campfire tell these glorious stories of this greek war with troy and greeks returning home they also told stories of old minoan legends if you're familiar with the story of theseus and the minotaur theseus is a royal son from the city of athens and athens is required on a regular basis to sacrifice several young men and several young women to this creature that lived in the labyrinth that was nosos this creature called the minotaur it was half man and half bull and so on a regular basis athenian youth get put on a ship they get sent over to king minos which is where we get the Minoan civilization from and where we get the term Minotaur from, who would send them down into this maze. Remember how Noah's had all these storage rooms, 300 plus rooms, something you could get lost in very easily? And within this maze, the Minotaur would go around and just devour them one at a time. Well, Theseus is able to kill the Minotaur and he's able to find his way out of the labyrinth because when he went in, he had a string that he had unraveled so he could just follow the string to get back out this is clearly a story of something that was happening between nosos and athens during the mycenaean age i mean to really hammer this home one of the things that we see stamped all over the pala nosos from the minoans is this double-headed axe it had some type of religious significance the symbol did well the greek word for double-headed axe was labyrinth maze anyway don't get too lost in the weeds that's just an interesting little connection 
At the end of this Homeric Age, by the time we get to the year 750 BCE, we have the beginning of something called the Archaic Age, and that is the beginning of ancient Greece. And right at that moment, that beginning of the Archaic Age, we get two poets, Homer and Hesiod, writing down a lot of these stories that have been being told throughout the Heroic Age. Homer writes these two epic poems called the Iliad, which is all about the Greeks destroying Troy, and the Odyssey, which is about one of those Greeks, Odysseus, making his way home from Troy and resettling in Greece. Sounds a lot like that Doric migration in. Hesiod also writes a couple big poems. One is called the Theogony, which is essentially the story of the gods and how the world was created and how the creator of the world gave birth to titans and how titans gave birth to gods. It's essentially a genealogy. He also wrote something called Works and Days, and that is a story about how humanity went from living in a happy golden age to a silver age to an iron age, which is the heroic age, to the time that he was living in when everything was just sucky, or at least from his perspective, just sucky. And very similar to the story of Adam and Eve is an explanation as to why life is hard. All right. Homeric Age slash Heroic Age. It's a dark age. We don't have writings from it, but when we get to the other side of it in the Archaic Age, we do get people writing down stories that have been being told throughout that Heroic Age. And the times of Mycenae and the Minoan civilization had passed fully into myth. Next up, the Ancient Greeks.